everyone, welcome to another Gadget Talk. I've been so excited about this one. Um, of course, 3D printing now is a new love of mine uh, from uh, since Christmas. I've been I wanted to get one for a while, and now we're really getting into it. Uh, so tonight is all about 3D printing, and I know Chad Chad's been in it for a little while, but the mastermind with us tonight is, of course, Dave Wagner, DJW House, and we're pretty much going to almost turn this over to him and field questions and ask questions because I know I'm going to learn a lot. What about you, Chad? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And and Dave, I mean, I ask him questions all the time, <laughs> although he's been printing less for, you know, what, six months, right? And That's I've been printing for July 1st. Yeah, I've been printing for over a year, but, you know, I, I don't do it enough. In, in fact, my machine sat. For a couple months, meter, uh, I have a lot of meters of filaments under my belt. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. So it's going to be a fun episode. I'm excited. Yep, I'm really excited about it too. Of course, uh, the reason why probably, and Dave was saying this earlier, the reason why he's got more time is because he's retired. We're having to work, but Dave gets to sit there and play. So, uh, but before we get any further, there's a few things we can need to do. First off, let's go ahead and hit our sponsors, and then we got some interesting updates for uh, worldwide cash con if you'd like to become a patron click on the become a patron link on the front page of the geocache talk website or head over to patreon.com forward slash geocache talk for more details patrons get the now famous blackout coins and other geocaching items during the year support levels start as low as the bison tube level which is only three dollars a month logwork the creators of the fantastic logbook made with genuine right in the rain paper the logbook's designed for the micro containers of the present and future, geared towards the hider who'd rather go caching than doing cache maintenance. Find them at logwork.com. That's L O G W E R K.com. All right. Wow. We're, looks like we got a lot of people wanting to do this 3D printing. But if you have not heard of the Worldwide Cache Con, hey, it is coming up and it is on June. It's not June. Sorry. Yeah, it's January. Month. January 30th and it's going to be starting at 10 o'clock central and it goes till seven o'clock and Chad, tell us a little bit about what we we got going on for cash con this year or this first cash con uh, we're doing maybe. Yeah. yeah uh, well, so it's going to be um, several hours. Each podcast will kind of have their own hour as well as other things uh, that they'll be doing, but we'll be doing a tour of HQ um, there and kind of a behind the scenes HQ. So if you've, been to HQ and you haven't actually had a chance to go in the back where everybody works and see stuff behind the scenes, you'll have a chance to see that. Uh, if you've never been to HQ, then you'll be able to see actually what's going on uh, there. Uh, Brian's going to be on there as well as a few other lackeys. I believe a lackey panel will be doing some gadget talk videos, uh, mm -hmm. highlighting some great cash builders and kind of some of their builds. You know, that's one of the things that, you know, we wanted this show for us to kind of highlight other cash builders and get their name out there and their caches they build are so other people know about them and, and find the caches. So it's going to be right. great uh, to, to, to do. And, and uh, the, you know, it's the very first one. So I'm excited. Right. And we were going, we got somebody that may be popping in a little bit later to give us a special announcement about some, well, some swag that is possible that we're going to be opening up that we can get through for this. Um, but all that's also going to be on the geocachetalk.com forward slash WWCC21 website. Uh, so you can go there. You can also see all the different events that are going to be going on throughout the day. And it's not just going to be a podcast. It's going to be an experience, an event. And go ahead and start talking about it on Instagram and Facebook and do the hashtag. This is the hashtag WWCC21, hashtag WWCC21, and we will see everything that y'all are posting, there's going to be giveaways and it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. And also uh, if you haven't had a chance to go on to the store uh, to get your coins or your package deals, um, your bundles, uh, you can click onto the, you can go to the website there and click on store. It'll take you right to the bundles uh, or you can go to the chroma print, uh, com and click geocaching and it'll have everything geocaching up underneath there. All right. So, yeah, the so really going to have a lot of fun doing a lot of this stuff. So really looking forward to it. So, all right, Dave, let's get a bit into talking about 3D printing. Sounds great. Um, I think tonight we're going to try to do a little tour of the printer. And I think, uh, Derek, you have a Christmas 
gift, so you probably have one you can show off a little bit. But I'm going to go ahead and, and show you my printer back here and give you an idea of what's going on there. Um, talk a little bit about going online and downloading and printing items, geocaching related and otherwise. There's a lot of online contents. We'll talk about that. And the last thing we'll talk a little bit about is uh, designing your own. And this is the area I kind of didn't expect to be proficient in, um, but we'll show you a, a kind of a zero cost, interesting tool you can use um, to get you started and you can design something on your own. So we're gonna head for that. Um, Derek, I don't know if you have that time-lapse video of the one um, right. I'm I'm pulling it up right now. I got to get okay. to it real quick, so I'll have it here shortly. I'll let you All know right. when I get it up. Let's, we'll, we'll, can you throw me on the uh, the mobile camera? <laughs> the yes. Camera. All right. All right. Got and, and I'm not sure how the audio is going to be here, so you can switch to my phone if, if we have a little more issue with hearing that. So, all right, here we go. So this is um, the setup I have for my Prusa 3D printer. And the printer itself is not this whole stack. It's really in the top section there. But this is something uh, made out of IKEA lac tables. And at IKEA, um, they sell this very, very cheap $10 table that you can um, then easily modify into printer stands. And that's kind of what we've done here. And every place you see orange or black uh, plexiglass uh, printed pieces, hinge pieces here, and so on for doors all of this is uh, was printed on this printer and uh, there's a lot of sharing that goes on in this uh, this hobby and folks uh, design these connectors in order to build up this particular lac table the main reason I did this was uh, for the lights uh, that you can see it's nice and well lit in there it's also good if you have a cat a lot of people with cats <laughs> they find this to be a very beneficial thing to keep the cat out and uh, it also is nice. I've got a camera mounted here, so I've got a place to put the camera. I printed some spool holders, and so there's a little rollers and things. There's a little slot that runs through the top. So this is the filament that it's currently printing, and 1.75 millimeter is the size of the filament. And basically, you change different colors and sizes of that. Um, you can also see my playtime here. I've got my mascot, uh, some Christmas. <laughs> folks uh, all printed up here kind of a thing and of course the the printer so real quick on this one uh filaments coming in the top there is a little wind up here that's how you run the printer as you wind it up on this little key see actually it's not that for, for that but, um this is so you can tell when the extruder is putting filament down you can see it goes forward and it backs up when it pulls it out uh, and feeds it in and I've added a little add-on here. I've got a little extra cooler that I threw on top uh, To keep the motor, but there's a basically a stepper motor there And it's feeding the filament and you can see the way this is all working is there's an X Y and Z axis each one of these has a stepper motor on it um, And underneath you can't see it in the back there, but basically the table moves forward and back general controls are here now I've, I've also set this one up it's underneath the stock alcohol and wipes for keeping the table clean and keeping things going. There's also a, um, uh, oh shoot, what's the name of the little computer they have for octoprint here? I've got a small- Raspberry Pi? Uh, pardon? Is it a Raspberry Pi? Yeah, Raspberry Pi, yeah. It's got a small Raspberry Pi uh, computer here that is actually offloading all the program from the computer, so I upload it on the Wi-Fi it goes to the Raspberry Pi, and the Raspberry Pi just goes and executes the code. And so that gives me the advantage of doing the time lapse. Um, yep. And I got it ready. So here is the time lapse that uh, Dave was just talking about. So let me get it to roll. So what's nice is it takes a picture at every layer, but it waits for the uh, or puts the extruder in the same position every image, so it looks like it's sort of floating along here. Yeah, I love that. That looks it's yeah, so cool. cool. <laughs> now I use the I, I use the camera, and, and, I, and I won't spend too much time on this, but I use the camera more for monitoring 
um, in that I can monitor it on my phone and you know keep an eye on the print how it's doing I don't have to stay in the room with the print so much and uh, it gives me a warning if there's something that's that's gone awry uh, sometimes absolutely that is a smoke detector in there come on we can flip back to that yep so apparently uh, you got a heating device here kind of a thing that that does um, generate some temperatures in the hundreds of degrees C. And so there's a smoke detector in the box. And the idea there is, of course, you get really early detection. I'm not expecting anything to catch fire. But it is a, a plate here that's heated up to probably sometimes 85, 90 degrees C. It can be hotter. Uh, the extruder itself is 200. I'm going to give you the display here. 200 and uh, 250. 50 degrees on there and the plates at 90 degrees. So yeah, things, things are cooking in here. Um, I generally run this with the doors open, though I do have uh, fans that I've added in here. And uh, you know, hey, let's get real nerdy. I've added a thermostatic controller so I can have this thing ventilate if it is uh, getting too warm during the summer. But in the winter months and stuff like that, it, it tends not to get that hot, but yeah. Definitely uh, safety first. Uh, lac tables are made out of, I think, lacquer and cardboard. So if you ever wanted something to be fire protected, it's a cardboard uh, house that you've got your printer in. So Dave, can you tell us what the advantages of having an enclosure is? So so the reason I got the enclosure, um, I, I don't have a cat, but if you have cats, that's why people get enclosures. Uh, it helps a little bit on the sound reduction that cuts it down. Uh, I like it because it gives me a place to put the lighting, the camera. I mean, it gives me a facility to um, aid in the printing. And, and the camera is kind of important because I can monitor it on my phone. Uh, the lighting, because you can see what you're printing. Printing black filament is hard to, to see it all kind of a thing. And the last thing which I have not yet done is there are some materials um, that require much higher temperatures to print. And they shrink a lot. So... If you don't have an enclosure, as soon as the printer gets a little bit away from where it's printing, that area cools down and shrinks and the pieces crack. So it can be used to print higher temperature materials. Haven't tried it yet, but- uh, Like, like ABS or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I've been real happy with materials, but I've not had a lot of outdoor experience with these yet. It's just what I've read. But yeah, you can use it for printing higher temperature materials. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't have an enclosure. I've had plans for one, but I'm too lazy. I haven't built one yet, and I don't I don't have anything except for a little bit of dust that may end up getting on it. But I keep it vacuumed. It, it does it does help to keep some dust off. I'll give it that too. So here's a question from Tricassius. He says, "What are the thoughts of resin printers?" So I don't know much about resin printers, which is interesting because when I was doing engineering work, everybody use resin printers to make model connectors and, and bits for the things we were developing. Uh, so I really don't know anything about them in terms of the mechanics, only about the deposition style that we have here. Um, but I think people tend to use them for very detailed and uh, more intricate items like figurines and things like that, because I think it can handle the complexity versus the deposition um, you're much more limited in, in your layer thicknesses and geometries of moving the print down. Right. Yeah. And usually they're smaller than what we have too. I haven't seen a bigger one yet. Um, if you do end up getting a bigger one, which I looked at one the other day, it's kind of funny. I asked Dave about this just a day or two ago. <laughs> um, uh, I think it's like half the size of our build plate and it's like 2,500 or $3,000. Yeah. They're, they're, they're not cheap. Uh, Again, for engineering development uh, of automotive parts and things like that, they can use any materials almost and so on and so forth. They can afford that kind of stuff. For hobbyists, yeah, a little, little different uh, story there kind of thing. But people are using them. I, I don't know that there's such a big following. Um, I don't but, know. And I, I think they use chemicals too, right? It's printed actually in a chemical with a UV light. My understanding of the ones I used to work with would be uh, some kind of a laser, it might be a UV uh, frequency, but and it basically solidifies a gel. So they layer by layer basically expose a gel to a laser and they solidify where they want it to be solid. And it can be very, very, very high resolution, which is why it's nice uh, that you, to use lasers to do a kind of a thing. So very high res. Right. 
but basically, yeah, they build from uh, a liquid and they just solidify pieces until they get it up higher. Versus the way a 3D printer goes basically a, a solid into almost like a liquid and back to a solid. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. I'm, I'm sharing a, a desktop there maybe. Is that? Yep, I see it. All right. So um, th this is, and it's not kind of cycling as we see it here. But this is actually something called the spaghetti detective. This is something that there's raspberry pie. Yeah, it, 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 it does. I can see this on my phone. I can see it at the grocery store. And so um, th this is one of the reasons why I have the Raspberry Pi there is, one, it's wireless. The Prusa makes you take a, a, a memory card and stick it in there to print otherwise. So it makes it wireless so I can just download from the computer. And I can monitor the videos. And I can actually uh, stop the print, pause the print, and stop the print remotely, too, which is nice. That is really cool. That's a really great because. Uh, so that's my two. That's my two. I don't know, Derek, you going to show off yours? Okay. So I have a. Mine is an, actually an Ender 3V2, uh, which is a really great uh, starter, really, 3D printer, even though right now it's, it's all stock um, for the next day or so um, because I already have a whole bunch of parts already coming for it. Um, and the reason why I want to upgrade is it's there's some things that I've already seen, like the the print the the plate is kind of a pain sometimes to pull on and off when you need to get it clean and stuff like that. But um, there's just some little minor upgrades and it's not that expensive to upgrade. Uh, so but it's just a really great printer. Um, I'm really enjoying it. It has pretty much printed. I got it for Christmas. This was a great Christmas present, and it has pretty much been printing nonstop since Christmas. So it's it's all open source. So all the firmware and everything is open source. So you can bring it in, and the printer itself actually starts at less than three hundred dollars. So it, and then you can of course go in and do all your different upgrades. And right now I have just a simple print printing up uh, that Dave actually designed for me, and it's my behind the cash logo on a. It's basically it's a front pa uh, panel uh, for a um, right in the rain tablet so those are that's pretty right now and here pretty soon it yep yeah dave's got it right there and here pretty soon i'm going to have to do a color change because i'm actually going to be it's i'm printing green right now but i'm going to add blue on the back of it i think i'm going to add blue i may add black i don't know but uh, i think it's going to be blue um to the back of it to go ahead and do the second next color so that's that's my printer it's a lot of fun um I've done already printed some little upgrades for it itself, uh, which is kind of fun with the 3D printer. Um, I'll move the camera around a little bit. I have printed, let's see if I can see it here. That's the, where my extruder is right there. But behind, I've actually done some cable management with some of these cable chains so they don't get all tangled up a little bit. Um, on the ender itself, the filament usually, sorry, I've got my GoPro here and I'm trying to get it. It's usually up here on the top. And what I've done is actually I printed a piece. And I'll see if I can adjust the camera, which is this piece down here. Uh, there's a blue piece here where I was able to put my filament to the side. And that caused it to come a lot easier straight into the extruder versus coming down to the from the top. And it seemed like it was kind of binding as it was coming in from the top. So that's why I changed where the extruder is itself which I really, I actually like that a lot better. That's good. So uh, is your, uh, your plate held on by clips right now? Yes, it is on. It's on held on by clips. Um, they, they, they come on and off and that's a glass plate and it's got a texture on it. Um, you can flip it over and have a smooth texture as well. But what I have on its way is it'll, it'll be a magnet plate. So I should be, it'll be a flex plate. So I'll be able just to pull the plate off and flex it a few times and my print will come off a lot easier. Um, I think um, I think that's what the Prusas come with is the flex plate, am I correct? Right, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's magnetically held on and it's just a flex yeah. plate to pop. See, um, oh, I'm, Dave I'm, has one there. Yeah, Dave's got one and that's what I'm upgrading mine to because I wanna have that, that capability as well. And I'm gonna go replace the extruder um, because the extruder that comes with the on the ender is actually plastic. And I actually have a metal extruder that I'm going to upgrade on that. And then there's a what's called a BL touch, which you'll 
as it comes across, it actually electronically level where each of the plate is. So if you're off just a little bit, it'll figure out and automatically adjust as it does your print. So you always have that level on there as well. So there's just a few little upgrades that I have coming. Um, so just, it's just like anything else. Once you start playing around, you start figuring out different things and really start doing a lot of different stuff. So, and I see Dan yeah. Miller is in, in there and Dan's got an Ender 3. Um, and I believe his son's got an Ender Ender three pro and then there's a three V two, which is what I have. Um, and there's just very minor differences between them. Um, but also Dan's got a really great, um, is the admin of a really great, uh, Facebook group called, uh, 3d printing for geocaching. And if you want to really see some really cool stuff from this really great group, and if you're 3d printing, you can join that. Yeah. Yeah. I actually asked Dan to come on tonight and talk about it, but evidently he has to work. So some people have to work, I guess. Yeah. I mean, but, uh, <laughs> um, I do have a question for you on your Ender. Um, one thing I want to say is I have two friends that actually just got that for Christmas as well. And uh, it's an amazing machine. And I, I saw them down for like $230 at one point. And I'm just yeah, like, that. Yeah. I thought about buying one just to have a second printer uh, on there. But um, so what's the difference? Do you know what the difference between the, the three, three V and the pro is? Is it it's just different? Really, one one of the between the three and the um, three V two is that it's got a little bit more of a silent. The fans are a little bit more qu they're quieter, um, and then it's a different. It's a silent board is what they call it. I think is what it is. Um, and then the the display is a little di little bit different. This display, let's see if I'll move my camera again, switch here, is like this. And then the the display for the three and the pro. Um, looks more like what the display on the on the Prusas look like, where it's a little bit more square. Yeah, I, I actually saw on Thingiverse, uh, you can actually, there's a pullout you can print that actually pulls it out closer to you, and then it tucks up away, too. Yeah, yeah, there's a whole bunch of different upgrades that you can do um, on this. I just really, it's, it's a really great machine. Um, it's a lot of fun. I've been not, and I'm sorry, this is a geocaching or a podcast here, but I've been printing more stuff that's not for geocaching. <laughs> I've been trying to do a lot of different cable management. Uh, usually I'd have my microphone in front of me, but I've actually, so usually I, I would have this microphone as I pinch my fingers in, in here, but I end up printing um, these here, which are the microphone uh, ties that actually lock it in here. And I actually end up using Tinkercad to actually redesign this uh, from what, was there on that I found on Thingiverse and we're going to get a little bit more into those here tonight because my bars on my microphone stand were a little bit bigger than what I could find on Thingiverse. So I ended up going back through and redesigning it and putting it back, putting it on here and then printing it. So. Well, you know, you got to print all those upgrades so you can print geocaches. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I have got a few things. There's, I've got a few things sitting here on my desk. So. <laughs> So that's one of, the, one of the things I found uh, the, the most beneficial, you guys probably agree, but Facebook sites, uh, online groups, et cetera, there's a lot of people who have the same equipment and a lot of people posting pictures. Hey, I did this. It looks wrong. What's wrong? Help me out kind of thing. So yeah. it is, you've been printing Derek since Christmas, you said. So, I mean, look mm -hmm. at what you've been able to do. And, and I'd, you know, same thing. It's been just a few months for me and, and it really advanced because there's so much to learn from. Oh yeah. It, and it's a lot of fun. Um, the only downside that I see to it is that I'll print and I have to wait two, eight, 12 hours before I actually get it finished. It, it slows me down. I wish I could print faster is what the biggest thing is, but I'd have things all over the house at this point. That's why so, you need more, more printers. That's right. <laughs> That's why I thought yeah. about a second one. Yeah, well, I, well not yet. I, I don't have the room for it right now. You so. have a printer farm. <laughs> I, I, I see a comment from the Pizza Ninja there. We're definitely going to talk about the yeah. uh, design process and some of the, the programs. So um, I, something I can pull up Thingiverse or maybe someone's Yeah, why don't you go ahead and bring it up, Dave? So, so one thing on the uh, time of printing, you can actually, in the slicer, depending on how detailed you want, you can actually do one that's just a kind of like a sketch or a quick draft that isn't the best print, but it will show you what you're going to get, you know, 
Uh, and then you can go all the way up to a really detailed, like a, what is it, a 0.5 uh, line, yeah. which is a really thin line, but it will take four times as long to print. So I have something that will take me seven hours to print or a day and a half, depending on what what I want to do it in. Right. Plus, you can always change your nozzle size, too, because different mm -hmm. uh, um, filaments so require like, different uh, nozzle sizes. Like I have um, a wood type of filament that's coming and it it requires just a little bit bigger than a 0.4 is what what i usually have what i have on here right now what i have a lot of but there's the larger one's going to require a little bit because it actually has some wood um some wood base wood elements in there wood fiber in it yeah, yeah. so it requires a 0.5 they recommend a 0.5 on discussions, I've heard people saying they can run it through a 0.4. Sometimes you have to unplug the nozzle, but that's exactly why I haven't ordered any yet. I actually almost ordered some the other day, but yeah, yeah, I have some Mother's Day gifts I'm going to be printing, and I want it to look like wood. Um, and what's really cool, I'm trying to get away from having to paint a lot of these if I need to. So I'm actually have been ordering filament in the colors that I want to actually have it be, and that's what's really great about these. Um, Hey, Dave, are we going to get into the type of filament that's really good for geocaching and maybe a little bit of that as well? Or what are we going to do? I, I think the limited thing I know is PLA is easy to print with and PETG is better for outdoors, UV insensitive. Um, yeah. but I don't have any experience with it, but I think that's the general recommendation. PETG is a better yeah, the, for outdoors. Yeah, the PETG definitely. I actually did some hinges for a. Uh, not a birdhouse, but a, a squirrel feeder that it lifted up on top and they lasted a week and a half before they broke. And then I printed it in PETG and it's been out there ever since. So six months or so. So it definitely is better in the weather. Yeah. And that's pretty much all I have. I think I have one thing that's PLA and I think that's the wood that's coming in. Everything else is PETG. Um, I did see somebody mention about glow in the dark. I have one on the way. Uh, Chad's got glow in the dark filament already. I do. Somewhere. So, yeah, yeah there's right. a lot of different things. <laughs> so, so a lot of the, if, I just typed geocache and Thingiverse here. If you go online, there's a lot of information. So just under geocache, um, and I've been paging through this here, Thingiverse.com, you can see a lot of different uh, containers and ideas and things like that. So I think a lot of folks uh, probably, um, contribute this, but they probably print a lot of their own items just off of here. Uh, but then to get into the, the design side of it a little bit, um, you also can modify these items and change the files a little bit. So I'm just going to kind of show maybe back on the camera here. Um, let me unshare. Oh, where am I here? Sorry, Derek. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, me. So oh, that one. Got yeah. It. So this, this is a, a Da Vinci Code cryptics and very well designed. It, it has detents on the, the changes and so on and so forth. You can see it's printed in this case with some metal looking filament. You, you know, the colors are your choice kind of a thing. But certainly this would be as is, as printed, uh, an item you could use in a theme cache or uh, you name it. You can make this with more and less letters. So, you know, that's just stock material off a, a thing of verse. Uh, I said my grandkids a maze um, and there's some money in there. I, I hope they don't watch the show, but basically you have to go through this maze. And I can't do it backwards on the thing here, but you have to, to get unlocked. You have to undo the maze, which is inside here. Um, and this I'm going to try to modify, and we'll talk a little more about it. But this is another cryptics. You know, you have to get the numbers, uh, the combination lined up in order to take it apart. So I'm going to play with that. So there's a lot of things um, online you can uh, just download and, and basically use. And then um, I'll let you guys show off what, what you might also have. But then we can go into Tinkercad and, and talk a little bit about how to modify items, because that's pretty much the design tool I've used to do uh, any design work I've done. And, and that goes all the way from just a pad here to um, geocaches that are, you know, this is a box with electronics and kind of a thing. So 
Um, you know, there's, there's given Thingiverse is, or excuse me, the Tinkercad is kind of an immature, simple tool. It's also kind of simple to learn. So we'll, we'll talk a little more about that in a minute too. I don't know if you gents have any items you wanted to show you printed or. Well, I'll, Derek, go ahead. I'll go ahead and start. Um, let me. All right. So the first thing that I printed um, as geocache wise was, of course, i have been wanting a hidden maze forever. I had asked for one and nobody had sent me one. So, but I so I decided to get a 3D printer and print one myself. Um, but <laughs> it's the same thing, um, and I've absolutely loved this thing. And it's, it's here. I can, of course, I've done it so many times. I usually can get it off here pretty quick, but not live, evidently. So that was the one of the first things that I printed um, off there. And then I started kind of playing around with a lot of different things. Um, I wanted something with my logo to actually put into caches. So I started kind of playing around uh, a little bit with Tinkercad. Um, I did, have done some 3D modeling in the past. Um, and something that I did not think of, and this is if you've ever done graphic work, when you do a 3D model for video or anything like that, it doesn't have to be solid. Um, and I actually, I have my first example that I did. I'm going to switch, switch up cameras real quick. So I can so you can see this. So this was the first one that I did, and you can kind of see these strings coming off of here. Well, it's hard to print when there's no base underneath it. So it was hollow. So the letters were solid, and the top of the ammo can was solid, but nothing else was solid. So there was nothing for it to stick to. So that was like, oh yeah, hey, doofus, remember you got to fill it in. So it knows what to print. So that was the first rendition of it. The second rendition actually came out a little bit better. I haven't painted this one, but it actually has the ammo can. I still some stringing because the lock part of the ammo can was really thin. So it was only like one or two lines. So it looks kind of rough there. And then I was like, well, I wonder what the ammo can would look like closed. So I went ahead and printed another one. And this one, I actually went back and painted so there's the actual ammo can itself with my built by behind the cache. And this is actually on the plane. So you can kind of see that it's, it's not even flat as it comes across because another way that we, I could have done this and I'm about to have to do it here pretty quick on this pad. It looks like is to actually do a color change and I could actually change the color. So each, so if the, the lower one would be one color, the can would be another color and then the top font, would be another color. So that could be, I could do filament changes through that by doing it that way. So that those are some of the really quick ones that I've done. Um, I love puzzle boxes. Uh, so here's, I don't know if anybody's seen one of these. This is a dovetail puzzle box. Well, I found on Tinkercad a geocache puzzle box dovetail as well. And I kind of, so I printed it up in blue and green uh, PETG. And it works the same way. So it comes up and then there, right there would be your cache. And really all it is, is that there's magnets in the top and the bottom and a bearing. And if I can get to the bearing, it's really tiny. So and it has a little bearing and that just goes in in one side and it just locks. So it doesn't come out until you, well, it's not supposed to, but I need better bearings. But um, so that's just... Some of the other ones, um, of course, management. I have a ton of SD cards all over the place. So I printed this SD card holder and it holds my USBs and all my SD cards for the cameras and everything else that I do. Um, so, and like I said, I've only been printing since December, uh, since Christmas. So I've been printing a lot of stuff, but it takes, like I said, the hours and just kind of playing around with it, spending a lot of time on YouTube and learning a bunch of stuff at the same time. That's nice. Those are cool. I like that bearing one. And so if, it, if you actually put magnets on the bottom of it and you stuck it underneath the bench or something, it could never open until you flipped it over. Right. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that's another, and well, there's, there's, I have magnets on both sides. So, um, but the bearing, I don't think it's fully, it's not a really good steel bearing. So it's not holding really good. I have earth, small earth magnets in there, but it's not, it's the bearings itself that's not having issues. I had a couple of them. One wasn't even hold, wouldn't even hold in there. So it's they're cheap bearings. So I need to find some better, better bearings to put in there. I've lost my bearings. So, <laughs> Tom asked 
a good question here. Um, it says when the thing is printing, does it know to stop at a point to change the colors? Uh, Dave could probably answer this better than me. Yes. I know he can. Yeah, Dave can answer that one. Yeah. So um, it, it, there's a, something called a slicer, and I'm gonna I'm gonna open up and uh, share this this slicer here if I can. Let's see if I can share a screen application window. There we go. All right. So there's there's something called a, a slicer, and uh, basically whatever you're designing um, here on this sheet, and and if I, I'm gonna look at the back side, it's got a little impression of gadget talk on it, kind of a thing. Um, when it's actually printed, it's printed in lots of layers. So I'm going to slice this, and I get the slider here. As I go down, let me go closer. As I go down this slider, okay, it's actually going here. Yeah, I got it. There we go. Actually, as I go down the slider, I'm actually going layer by layer through the plan of what the printer is printing. So here's the first layer, and you can see the gadget talk there. And then it gets a little thicker. And a little thicker and then it covers it with the second color and then you print the rest of, of the material so you know it the computer lays it out in slices as it prints it now on this particular program here there's a uh, to the right here there's a little print mode um, item I can click and basically it it tells the printer there's a color change here so now it's going to change from one color to another so it'll actually stop the printer at this point and uh, instruct you how to change the, the color, okay? Now, I can also add in here in this particular uh, slicer a pause, and this says place bearings and slots in resume printer. I use this for placing a magnet, so I may print up so high, put a pause in, and say, you know, put north side up magnet, blah, 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 and it'll again stop the printer, I'll put the magnet in, then resume printing, and then it'll uh, basically, um, Cover the magnet and embed it inside the material. And if we let's go to the the can I go to the side cam there? Did I? Yeah, I had it. I, no. oh, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's oh, here, here it is. Yeah. So, so this this is, uh, and I'll show you. This is part of my my uh, geocache log release system here. And um, what you have here are two printed pieces, and. Um, it's kind of an, an axle kind of a thing or an axis there where uh, it clips to something and then when you pull it back with a motor, it'll go ahead and release the catch. I'll show you a little more of that later. But basically, you know, there's, there's nothing to be seen inside other than some writing I have uh, and nothing outside. Inside of here are magnets with opposing polarities that are buried. And basically, instead of having a spring in there, I don't know if this is economically a good way to do it, but instead of a spring, it essentially gives you the, uh, the push uh, to make this so when you push the cash back in, it folds down and then it retains it. So it gives it does a spring function. So that was done by pausing the print at a certain point, sliding in the, the magnets, and then letting the print continue over the top. There. And, and I see that's in PLA. Well, I think that would be fine in PLA because it's actually not exposed to the to the light directly or to the weather directly. It's inside. Right. Yeah. Well, and, 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 let me, let me uh, I don't think we'll put back here or not. I, I'm, I'm probably not going to use PLA. I, I use the PLA a lot for um, printing to experiment because it's easier and faster and so on. And then now this this is a log container. It's got a screw on top, okay, the, the log is inside. And this also has a magnet in both ends. And again, it's completely covered with plastic. And uh, this is part of, an, and I, I won't push it down here, but part of the cash dispenser. And there's a magnet in the bottom here that's actually gonna eject this like a spring uh, would eject it as well. So that, again, this is, all what you're looking at here, this is all a 3D printed uh, assembly, and you can kind of see yeah, it's a little sticky, but then I push it in, it clicks, and then it won't come out until I activate it kind of thing. So, okay. And that's cool. I've seen that actually in action, and it, the log uh, container itself actually kind of like sits here and levitates, right? But it doesn't yep. do it from the top. Yeah. So uh, back to the main camera. We'll, we'll do a quick of that. 
So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, well, not the Derek one with his back end. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so th this, is, this is all done on Tinkercad. This is all 3D printed. Um, you can see, uh, you know, the front plate area here. I've got a layer of black behind white. So I printed white on the top, left some openings, and you can see it's actually a black material. So then the uh, uh, logo sets through. There's a black um, uh, coating on the on the key here, and on the back of this, I just put some pins. Took a soldering iron and melted the pin down because it's plastic and it melts pretty easy. I Thought you can see it in the um, the oh yeah down, down in the corner maybe yeah. here yeah so I just took a soldering iron and just pressed that on and riveted it together and you can see I've got the um, little speaker here and the mounts fit in I've got uh, three millimeter screws that uh, go into just the rough plastic nothing threaded and put it on here's my um, my servo motor. And you can see the little bit of the cash release mechanism sticking out here. That's the, the piece I just showed you with the little uh, box with the magnets embedded into it. And then we'll do a, the demo side of this. Now, here we go. All right. So now when the cash is in here, I'm just going to move active, manually activate the servo. It pushes it out. It's basically just, again, there's a magnet on the bottom that's opposing the one on both sides of the, uh, the orange thing. And then I stuck one magnet that is not opposed on the top just to hold it, just to make it easier to, to get it out of the container. And a lot of this is, is you know, Dave playing around to see if I can do magnets and colors and things, but you know, it makes for kind of an interesting um, waste of time to spend your time, but also makes it interesting for 3D printing. And you can see in the box here, uh, I've designed the mount for it. It's uh, uh, printed in, in the plastic there, so now I've got a way to connect this all together. If I was doing this in wood, it wouldn't be a six by six box. It would take a lot more dimension to, uh, to make that thing happen. And because it's 3D printed, you can really get down in the, the geometries um, and again, customize it with lettering, with icons, and so on. And so I, I'm I'm really excited about these, you know, six by six boxes uh, that I can, you know, put a geocache in it. And it's nothing on CAD, quote unquote. This is all, put that away there. This is all uh, Tinkercad, which I think, I don't know, it's preschoolers or something like that use this to design CAD. Um, so question, questions on that. Otherwise, I was going to do just a little uh, demo maybe on uh, on Tinkercad. I think Derek yeah, must so be changing filament, no? Yeah, he's changed. I had to mute him because you could hear him. Um, but uh, just finding a way, I asked a question about the plastic. So everything expands and contracts in different temperatures. Are you finding uh, that you need to have better tolerances or, or clearances uh, when making the caches? Yeah, so uh, between different materials, uh, PLA, which is not a good outdoors one, it seems like it prints pretty true to dimension and uh, spacing and things like that. And the PETG, which is better for outdoor, it's a rougher material. And I've had to leave a little more um, uh, tolerancing, you know, call it. But um, again, for a three millimeter um, screw to hold bits together on um, what you just saw there, the hole is 2.9 millimeters. And uh, the screw head, I just make it a little bigger than the, the head kind of a thing. And that snugs in there nice and tight. If you make it three, it's a little loose. If you make it 2.8, it's a little, it's a little uh, too tight. So that seems to work well. In terms of temperature, um, almost everything is the same material, plastic. So it, it hasn't yet shown to be an issue. Now, I haven't put any of these out in winter. I, I don't know what they're like uh, in, in, in really cold Chicago weather or anything like that. So TBD, you know, we'll find out. We'll get some experience on it. Um, but I'm working probably in tenths of a millimeter in terms of what is kind of important. And most of the time it's, it's 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeters is the kind of spacing. So, and I, and I, I hear the, I think, you know, this, uh, particular piece here, there's a, a, a space for the, the bit to go through and so on. I think that's something in the neighborhood of like two tenths you know, a tenth of a millimeter on either side kind of a thing. And it's big and sloppy and it, it has no difficulty 
Um, it has no difficulty staying aligned, which is good. And it also is it's very bouncy and doesn't hang up. So, you know, that seems to work, you know, two tenths of a millimeter. So um, the nicest thing about a 3D printer is you print one of these and then you look at it and say, oh, that's too tight. You just adjust the dimension and print the next one. You know, so you have your own prototyping machine in a sense too. Right. And I've done that many times. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, what I'm what I'm printing right now, I'm 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 attempting to, and I'll get to Tinkercad in just a second here. I'm attempting to put this, and it'll probably be uh, adjusted to be four numbers or three numbers, not five. But basically, in have the p the the perp tube inserted into it a bit, so that when you open the end, you get the top of the tube. So the intention is electronics in the end that's sticking out, and then the buried side of the tube is inside of the cryptics to keep it shorter, and so this will fit in a very small space. So, so rather than being, um, you know, th well, get this length, it's going to be, you know, that length kind of a thing. And then instead of five numbers, it'll be three. So some of the things I'm trying to do right here in Tinkercad is do exactly that. I printed out some different cap sizes and I'm playing with them to see how well they fit and if things go together. And that's what the the piece that I'm I'm prototyping there. That's really that's cool. great. And Dan Moore wanted to know if those are public. I'm thinking that design of that you just showed is is your design in your own little box there, right? So 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 this this here um, is as exactly was downloaded from Thingiverse. Okay. And it's not a bad one. This other cryptics, the fancy gold one here, exactly as it was done on Thingiverse. And most of the things on Thingiverse, the license is give credit and you can use it for no license and no fees kind of a thing. So you could put this in a geocache, but if you ever wanted to sell it or do whatever, something with it, you'd have to give credit to the person, not even uh, royalty or something like that. So um, a lot of that stuff's available. As soon as you start making your own uh, customized versions kind of a thing, um, you know, then you could, I guess, license it freeware yourself if you want. But these these are the custom bits. And yeah, I think. The pad was was freeware, and I adapted it to my use, and that's typically in Thingiverse how it works. I think what Dan was referring to is your little ma uh, magnet mechanism. Uh, patent pending, but I haven't applied for a patent, so. <laughs> we for sale sometime. <laughs> yeah, I, and, and, and the, the, for what it's worth, I do want to get it to the point of where I could share it more easily. I don't know if I'd think of it or not, uh, because it's actually probably cheaper to use springs for most people. But for geocaches, or if you just want to be cool, I think the magnets are kind of neat. So, uh, but, I, but certainly for the, the gadget talk group and, and folks, uh, when all the bugs are worked out, I think that'd be something I'd certainly uh, share with folks. And the six by six container it was in it. That's a plastic what Hobart container or something that you have. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> the exterior container. Yeah, th th this is is always inspired by bounce bounce. Him and his urban caches, you know. <laughs> so part part of my thing is I, I, I I'm I'm have, I'm challenged that I can't really go in the woods anymore, uh, from from a lot of perspectives and things like that. So I'm gonna head a little more urban. But I want to do it, you know, my way kind of a thing. And I'm really trying to explore this uh, um, urban caching with the 3D printed. Uh, as, you know, Chad, you've got yourself a router that you do the plexiglass. And, you know, it, it looks so awesome. So I'm going to try to be a little bit like Ike or a little bit like Chad. Uh, be like Chad. Be like Bob Bounce. And uh, so, so part of my inspiration is to, to reinvent the Wired series in uh, urban style type boxes. So we'll yeah. see. Well, you'll you'll be good. I mean, you'll be you'll be more like you, better than bounce yeah. bounce. So <laughs> I just happen to have lots of tools. So <laughs> those are the 3D printers as as well. So I like uh, are there other questions? Otherwise, I was going to throw Thingiverse up here and maybe show a little bit of that. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and go to Thingiverse there. So so this is um, it's a free web based. Um, program. Uh, I'm going to find it. Tinkercad. What am I saying? Thingiverse. Um, this is Tinkercad. So 
it's a it's a free software. It's I think pretty much meant to be uh, an introduction to CAD kind of a thing. I do want to mention that um, I've actually done some simulations of Arduino here, and this uh, Simon with Simon with Servo. Um, Derek benefited from this because I didn't have the hardware built up, and rather than breadboard it, I actually built it up in Tinkercad, and I ran it in Tinkercad, so I could um, actually run an Arduino. It lights LEDs, it moves servos, and things like that. So that was actually kind of interesting to have a, a code simulation uh, there. Um, I have a, uh, a ton of things I've been doing for family, for friends. And then some of these are just iterations, but it gives you an idea of the, 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 the scope of how much I've been, been using this thing. Um, I did want to kind of share a couple things and how it works. And I think the, the simplest version of this is that notepad that Derek was just uh, changing Changing uh, uh, printer on. So here, here's the original downloaded thing of her. Somebody made this, and then I modified it. And I just want to real quickly go through kind of what is thing of her. So thing of her is you take a box and you type in the dimensions you want, and you can make something like a item like this this blank piece here, um, one millimeter, you know, thick, and uh, Make it the size you want in direction and it just basically is you're going to take a three-dimensional device and move it around kind of a thing you can import svg files which is what this is i took the geocaching logo converted it to sg uh, G, svg file and now you've got a logo to play with i took some little boxes like these red boxes but these are really small ones. And then I put another little red box on top of it. I combine them together. I spaced them out. And there's ways that that gets, gets done. But the magic is then you turn them into holes. So right. these are, and they would go on here. These are actually listed as holes. And so when I take these and combine them with something solid, it will put the holes of this shape in. And you can kind of see pretty quickly as we get to this bit, these holes match what you're seeing in the top of the plastic piece. This plastic piece, or this one here, the one millimeter thick, is basically this just resized. And I'm going to go backwards here. I'm going to unconnect things. I'm going to do this a couple of times, and you can see the bits that made it up. So here's the piece. The red piece is a flat one of these I added to the top to make the dimension taller. I didn't want to stretch it because then this curve would change. The little holes that are put up here, okay, I put the holes in at the, at the right distance. And then when I combine the holes with the pieces, it put the holes in the plastic. And this gadget talk piece right here is that SGV file. I've made that a hole but I've raised it 0.6 millimeters above the back surface, so it doesn't go through. And when I combine those together, it puts the indent, indent into it. Now, simple tools, but let me just take this. There's an alignment tool, so I'm gonna put this in the center. There's things to raise it up and down. So these are pretty basic you can see I can move things in different dimensions. So there's some, some fundamental items you can do. And I can even put it all the way down to the bottom. And now if I combine these together, instead of having an indent for whatever, it's actually going to have holes. Now, this would be a problem because it would be floating free. But basically, it's a subtract and add. And what you have is lots of shapes, cylinders, circles, and so on to combine to do these things. So you know, just to give you an idea, this is SVG files, which you can convert a JPEG or whatever to it. And it's fundamental block shapes that you can use to build these things. And and the way you got the curves at the bottom of the, the block is by just doing a bevel. Is that correct? Or what is that? 
you can do a bevel, or um, also there there is a. Um, uh, let me go back. Give me one second. I'm going to pull up a different example here to talk a little more about that. So, on making it a hole on the top right, if we go back to the main screen, if people look, there's a gray stripe shaded. Uh, uh, look, uh, box and cylinder, and that's what makes yeah. a hole. So that means hol it's hollow or a hole. If you go down a little bit further, or, or on the other side, you you can you know want it. You could say you want it solid. You could say you want it, you know, and then you can pick actually the uh, infill, how much it's infilled on the inside of it as well. Right. So um, the boxes can have a radius on them, and so I can make the corners curved to answer Derek's question is so you can add those radiuses easy enough right uh, the this is just a hole so if I wanted to cut a box in half I would could just combine a hole with a this and I'd have a half a, a box kind of a thing and so on and so forth so there's there's a little bit of controls and I can also take what is a box and convert it to a hole so here's that cash dispenser that I had and I could make that into a hole for what that's worth but i'll leave it solid for the moment and i'm, I'm going to make it transparent just for a second and you can kind of see the threads you can see the little uh gap where um it catches to the uh, latch and so on the threads all of this is made up of pieces and down here in the bottom there's a void and that void is basically where the magnet goes so i'll print up to the top of this hole the printer stops, I shove the magnet in, and then I keep printing, and it prints the, the rest of this container. And how That's big really is the magnet that you have in there? Is it a 10 millimeter, or what is it? The, I think you could, might be able to change the, 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 the setting, but this is all millimeters, yeah. Millimeter will be a lot more accurate. Well, no, yeah. I was just talking about the hole for the magnet. Was it like a 10, 10 millimeter magnet, or? So, you, uh, so dimensionally, it can be 0.15. I think it even goes down to hundredths of a millimeter. But the magnets I purchased, I probably bought, you know, a half inch or a, a quarter inch uh, a size or something like that, whatever that is, and just converted it to millimeters. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna deconstruct um, this real quick here, just to give you an idea. So here's a cap I got off the Thingiverse and I cut it off the top of a bottle. Here's the, the ring, which is was in the wrong location that I cut off the bottle. Here is a uh, slice that I took to flatten the top of something to get it to the right height. You can see the hole there. Uh, here's the bit with the, the bottom piece, and then there's the magnet that sat in it, which is a hole. So all these bits are basically, I just, little by little, and I'm taking apart. Here's a ring where the, the the latch goes, and then I took the hole of a ring, a toric style, and I put those together, and that made the little cutoff in the latch. Here's the tube to make the inside smooth because this dimension on the top wasn't quite what I wanted it to be, and I didn't want to have a bumpy inside, so that made the, the inside. So I just took apart basically that cash dispenser piece, the bottom piece, not the screw on, and all I did was cut this thread off a of Thingiverse, and I borrowed this off Thingiverse. And the rest of these are geometric shapes combined together. And I don't want to make it like it's a walk in the park. you got to learn how to use some of the tools. But there's a few YouTubes and so on to do that. Here's that cash nice. bit that I, I showed you where the cash pops up. And um, the bit in the back where the little latch goes through here's a cover and it's got a magnet and things like that so yeah it's it's really very um intuitive in the sense of you think in shapes rather than dimensions curves arcs and degrees which is kind of nice um and you can kind of see by what i've put together here there isn't a lot of um limitations if you bit by bit want to put these things together um, it saves everything and then it runs through everything I did to assemble it to get it back to its base form 
Um, so here's that front face plate with the speaker on it. It's the back side for the one with the keypad. And then I made from a box, and then I just cut a curved box and made a hole out of this. This is actually, oddly enough, it's used to round the corners <laughs> of something you put inside of it. So I put something inside of here, then use this to take and round the corners because I wanted a certain dimension. So anyways, so I've kind of dumped a lot on Tinkercad, but I don't know. I found it to be very effective in doing uh, what I've done so far. You know, we got that release mechanism and all the bits and pieces and now working on, on some more stuff. Yeah, Tinkercad, that was the first program I uh, did any uh, designing in. Um, and it was fun. It was interesting. Um, when I first started, cause I didn't know anything about it. I don't, I didn't know anybody had a 3d printer. So just kind of learning from YouTube and everything, but yeah, that's uh, it's a good program. I use it quite a bit now. Okay. I'm going to pull my print off just to pop it off the board. Okay. So people were at, you know, we were talking about being able to print, uh, different layers, different colors. Here's one that I did that is different colors. So pretty much like what Dave mentioned, um, before, uh, I printed to a certain level with red and then white and then black, and then at the top, I did yellow, and then black again. So That's really cool. I was too hard. To, on mine, um, I got it printed one way, but I wanted to try something different on this one. Um, and Dave and I were playing around with this at the beginning. Uh, between layers and height, when I actually dropped in the code into my slicer, I tried doing it with height, and it didn't like it, so I ended up what was going on earlier is I ended up pausing the print itself and when I wanted to and physically doing it versus it telling me I wouldn't wanted to do it right at the end of the layers where I wanted it to. So that's why there's a, <clears throat> this line right here, there's, that's why there's a little bit of a color change there. There's a coming at an angle of the green and now it's got the blue going back across. So that's kind of what happened there. So kind of had a change color uh, in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. uh, Versus before it started filling in behind, um, behind, behind the cache, uh, <laughs> the the blue. So that's why Chad had to mute me earlier because I was trying to get that situated. So I apologize for me bumping around with my microphone at that point. <laughs> yeah, no problem. And in the cost of this in plastic, it's it's uh, I don't know, is it about a a, a buck, ten bucks a pound? Yeah, about ten dollars a pound or something like that. So when you're doing fractions of ounces, these things cost 20 cents or 30 cents or yeah. whatever kind of thing. I did want to show you the, the metal uh, plate here. So um, this is heated. It's normally pretty warm. It's very, very, very thin. And uh, it needs to be very clean and it's magnetically attached to the print. But when it cools down, you just basically bend it. Yeah, let me do it. I don't want to be too aggressive here. There we go. And everything pretty much comes off. Now, so this this piece is intended to be the one that uh, goes into the preform. And again, it would get combined with this. Now, this is something I should mention. I made this 117% of the size of the one that um, was on Thingiverse. So you can see it's slightly larger. And the reason I did that is so it would fit over the preform. Um, and all I have to do is take all these other bits, there's about um, 10, 12 pieces here, and print these at 117% of their size, and they'll all match up, which is nice. Um, this has a, what appears to be kind of a mess in the middle there. That's called uh, supports. And basically because the, the top here um, is kind of hanging over, it needed something to support the edge so it wouldn't print in the air like uh, Derek tried doing on the sign kind of thing. So you actually can print in uh, extra plastic, and then I'm not I'm not going to be able to do this all now uh, easily, I don't think. But, but yeah, maybe it will be easy. But basically, sometimes removing the supports is the worst part. Okay, so I just removed the supports, and it left. Now well, there's still some more support in there I have to clean out. But basically, it, it left the piece behind that I'm going to I'm going to use. So I'm going to get the rest of it off. So, anyways, that. That, that was the piece I was printing, and, and again, if I can get the support off, maybe we can see if it fits the model like I thought it would. There we go. Yeah, and you know, when you're, you know, since we build a lot of geocaches, we, we you know, we usually have tools and shops. Um, 
some stuff that I build on mine are things for my shop. So I use Milwaukee um, for my tools, and this is actually Milwaukee battery holder. So it actually, um, you can either put it on a wall or in a drawer or underneath the side of a stand, and your battery actually just slides in and clips, and it won't come out, and it just slides right off. So you have storage for your batteries as well as, you know, the, the uh, smaller batteries there. So there's actually lots of different things for tools, you know. Um, I think most of the 3D printers, you go on there and get tool stands um, for them as, as well uh, or, or different parts, components for making your tools uh, on there. Um, another thing that I've built is um, these RFID multi card readers. This is a multi-pass. Multi yeah. No, one second. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, COVID. No. Um, <laughs> so the, uh, this multi-pass, obviously, it's not doesn't have anything on it yet, uh, but it's already a FID card reader or holder. Um, it actually has a hole in it, so you can actually mount it to your cache so someone couldn't take off with it, and they could they can scan it, whatever. It's, it's kind of a fun thing uh, to add to a cache if you want to. Um, I mean, I've built so many things, um, different different holders. Go off of this here. Um, sorry there. Let me, uh, let me cough here for a second. Well, what while he's coughing, so the good news is it did fit. So I took the I took the top off, uh, put a hole in it. So now when it's on the preform, and now I have to of course reprint um, this to 117 percent, so it fits on here. But basically now I've uh, I've got essentially, oops, essentially what could be um, a preform with. Gosh, this mirror thing is driving me nuts. Um, <laughs> a preform, but I again, I'll have you know less less numbers on it. And I'm thinking to put some electronics in here with a small display, and you'll be able to do whatever with the display here and solve it, and then get the combination to take it out. So that's conceptually what I'd like to do. Uh, we'll see if it you know what all fits in there and things like that. But yeah, so again, this is just uh, Thingiverse. Or, uh, Tinkercad, rather, cutting a hole in the top with a hole, uh, yep. taking a thread from a cap, and I stuck the cap inside the top, merged it together to one piece, and then, uh, and again, I can play with the size a little bit more kind of a thing, but printed it up, and now it's a preform that will have something less than a five-digit code to get to the log. That's really cool. I, that, I can't wait to see that completed. I'll be looking forward yeah, to seeing that. <laughs> that'll be really cool. Cool. Yeah. So another thing that I did here uh, was a um, was for a uh, Jurassic Park cache I was thinking about months and months ago um, uh, called Dino DNA. And it, it's kind of funny because I think Rumacast just put one out with the exact same name. But if people know, you know, Jurassic Park, Barbara Saul can, um, you open it up and it has the DNA on it. And this one actually pops up. <clears throat> the only thing it doesn't have is a the fluid in here actually does glow with UV light. So I'm actually at a UV LED in there, but all this you can find on Thingiverse. Um, oh, did we lose my build cam? Yeah, we just lost <laughs> it all <of a> sudden. <laughs> Classic. Uh, so anyways, all that stuff is on Thingiverse. You can print it um, up there and, and find you know anything you want. That's really, I think, where a lot of people go to kind of search and, and do the research, see what other people have built, and then you can take that over to your Tinkercad or whatever CAD program you're using and adjust it. Right. Now, we're, we've been using Tinkercad, uh, but the one that I, when I did my logo, I actually did it in Adobe Dimensions, which is a 3D modeling for video animation and graphics. So I did it, did the logo in there. And like I said, then I just kind of filled it back in and eh, I want to, I want to redo it with Tinkercad. And now, now that Dave has shown how to do the SVG, I have my logo in SVG. I can drop it in an actual top part of it into that. So that that's going to be a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can do uh, lettering in Tinkercad. You can't do wrapping of letters so much. Uh, there, you know, there are some limitations to it, but basically, letters, numbers, text—they're uh, all available and accessible uh, in Tinkercad as well. So it's uh, right. They're just limited on the font style. 
So there's not yeah. a lot of different font selection. And that's yeah. mine's kind of a weird font. So that's well, well, well the, the, but the exception is you go and take a JPEG and just convert yep. it to SVG and you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Right. We're speaking nerd Greek too. <laughs> nerd speak. Nerd speak. Nerd speak. Called, geek speak. Geek speak. Yeah. So going back to filaments here, um, there are several different types of filaments. So we talked about wood. Um, you have your PLA, PETG, but there's also some that look like marble or, or rock. So mm -hmm. you can actually get some filaments that will make it look more naturally like a rock. I've not printed with one, but um, it's something that I've wanted to try. Do you? I have yeah. color changing filaments, glow in the dark, stuff like that. The, the shiny... Um, like I think you can see on the reel right here, yeah, how shiny it is. Um, I have it in gold and brass, uh, lots of different colors and stuff I haven't opened yet, but, um, yeah, so there's so many different types out there. Uh, I print a lot of stuff in PLA because I do a lot of stuff that's not geocaching or is not going to be out in the weather. I think PLA prints a little bit finer, uh, than PETG, but, uh, for anything geocaching or it's going to be outside, I do the, the, uh, PETG. Dave, was that PLA? Yeah, this this was all PLA because it's got that nice shiny silver, gold, yeah. and copper um, colors in it. And the blue, and we didn't mention this, is silk. Uh, there's a lot of silk um, PLAs out there, too, and they, they have kind of a nice shine uh, to them as well, which is kind of nice. But the, the one thing I, uh, I don't have, I'm not sure I would ever do, we'll see, but you actually can get an automatic filament changer so that you could literally print um, black letter inside of the silver and, uh, you know, this monogrammy piece. You could actually use different colors. Um, the way we're doing it is by, you know, printing in layers by changing the colors. But there's so something called a, 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 a multi-color management unit or something like that that has a little Arduino or, or um, whatever in it that changes the filament for you. It uses a lot of extra filament, but uh, when you see models where it's, it's painted and you know color after color, everything mixed in, not just at levels, uh, that's the way that's done. And I think that'd be kind of interesting or nice to do, but I don't know that it's worth it for non-artistic um, kind of activities. I think just the layer levels is good enough. It's the um, I guess I'm making lemonade out of my lemons. I don't have a multi management unit for, for printing multiple colors at the same time, but it can be. Yeah. And so, you know what? Oh, go ahead, Derek. You got something. So Dave has a question. Is, is there a site that compares printers side by side, um, like Persa uh, to Creality? And that's what this, it mines at Ender 3 create by Creality. Um, you can always find them on YouTube and there's everybody's doing like a, a Prusa versus Ender 3 or Pro or CR10 or there's a whole bunch of them. So there's a you can, you can find them that way. I don't know if there's a specific site kind of to do that. Yeah, right off. YouTube has so many people that review them. I just kind of I know when I purchased mine, I knew no one. I didn't know anybody that had a 3D printer, but I wanted one, and I actually talked to. Uh, Geo Gearheads, I was, uh, talked to them about it since they, they do a lot of stuff uh, that way, and they actually recommended the Prusa as well. But if you go on YouTube, uh, just type in the year you're looking for, like 2021 3D printer reviews, and you know, look it up that way. Well, 2020 yeah. probably. There aren't probably too many reviews yet in 2021, but yeah, I don't know. I, some stuff I was looking at the other day, but it wasn't 3D printers it had reviews for. Okay. Yeah, I did the same thing. I just researched YouTube and stuff. There's no good uh, comparative site. I, I will kind of say that um, there's a lot of good printers in the, I'm going to call it low cost, 200 to $400 range um, that are pretty darn good and a lot of mods to make on those because people adapt them. So I kind of took the flip side and I went more expensive on the printer, but hopefully less on the mod side. I think it all kind of washes out. I think you get the same capability somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, I'm about to mod mine out pretty soon, uh, probably within the next few days. A little bit more right now it's stock, but I've already got all the, a lot of the parts coming in. Um, and it's not that there's an issue with it, but there's some capabilities and maybe some fine-tuning I want to do. 
one of the biggest things that I've noticed um, with the 3D th printing 3D, you have to make sure that your bed is leveled and your nozzle stays the same consistency all the time. And that's why one of the mods that I'm getting is going to be doing that all the time. So kind of make sure that it does that yeah. um, because there's been some issues and you'll, if you start looking at a different reviews and stuff like that on the ender glass. Oh. So um, real quick uh, on, on mine. Now I noticed that are you back Derek? Yeah, I'm back. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. You just froze there for a minute. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, so I was just talking about uh, noise level too. I don't know if there's a huge noise level, but you can print different types of uh, parts for your printer to to, to kind of uh, make them quieter, um, also kind of level better. I think, Dave, you did something for your feet of yours you printed. Yeah, yeah I printed some little vibration isolation feet. Um, the, the, the lack boxes are notorious for amplifying sounds and things like that. So definitely pair that. And, and, and to, to Derek's point of the mods, uh, my printer is sort of stock, but I've already made probably seven, eight different adaptions to it. And bed leveling was the first thing I, I addressed because that is, again, the most important thing, bed leveling. So that was the first mod I made, major mod I made. And I, I know for mine to, to quiet it up, which made a big difference, I actually have mine on a brick. Oh, that and that's good. on top of EVA foam. So I have EVA foam, uh, four pads in the corners, and then a, a big uh, six, 16 by 16 or 18 by 18 block on there. And that actually made a big difference on the sound. But um, uh, So Dan was asking, would you buy uh, extra nozzles along with the printer initially? I did. I went ahead and got different sizes uh, within the last week anyway. So I mean, I've only had it for less than two weeks, but... Um, I went ahead and ordered some more nozzles because a lot of they're they're relatively inexpensive. So a lot of people have, when they see the nozzle start clogging, they just change it out and put a new one in and go and keep on rocking. So I've seen that, or and there's you get a little needle to clean it out. But different, like we were talking earlier, different sometimes different filaments will require different size nozzles, or if it's a too high of a temperature, you may need to change out your nozzle because that nozzle may not be able to take that high temp too. And that also deals with your hot end as well. It's cause like ABS and some of the other filaments require higher temperatures and like the stock, um, hot end on the, um, on the ender can only go up to 230, uh, 235. And after that, it's going to start warping and you're going to start getting a lot more clogs. So that's what one of the, that's another part that I've got coming in is a new hot end. Because some of my filament wants to run between 230 to 260, and that's PETG. So there's, I don't want to push it. So I'm running it all on the lower end. It's, I'm getting good prints, but I don't want to push it any higher because of I don't want to warp that. Plus, you also can start putting off fumes that are not good for you. So Yeah, the VOCs can be an issue, which is an issue with ABS. They recommend actually venting directly outside if you're print, yeah. being in an enclosure and printing outside. And that was one thing I was going to bring up when you're looking at your filament. Um, there's a big subject with people on what brand filament to use, right? There's a lot, there's always discussions on that. I use a lot of um, the uh, Overture filament uh, and Hatchbox is what I like. But, you know, I, I think Overture is like $20 yeah. a pound, you know, um, and Hatchbox like $26. I think you're going to be within the 20 to Eight bucks, um, a kilogram. Sorry, two point two pounds. Um, uh, but when you get your filament, um, on the filament itself, it actually says the, the recommended temperatures to print at. Um, so that's something you want to make sure you read. Um, there, but then again, you're gonna you're gonna play with it. So at first, I got mine. Uh, I get a lot of stringing with my prints, and so you know, uh, as you know, to Dave's point, you know join a Facebook group for your printer and you can go ask them all kinds of questions, which is what I did. And I found out I was printing it too high of a temperature. So bring it down some. So, you know, just different things you'll learn along the way. Yeah. So a um, question from uh, engineer 42, uh, what is your preferred slicer software and why? I, as I was watching Dave's using 
Prusa. I'm I've been using Kira, but I think I want to play with some Prusa and see which one I really like. Just hey, I'm only two weeks into this. I can switch easy, and that's not going to hurt my feelings one bit. <laughs> well, and if you could use that with yours, um, then you have more resource on your yeah. slicer. If you have a question, yeah, that, and that's and I know I can because I've seen people switch over to that as well. So um, I'm I got it right here for you, Dave. Yeah, yeah I, I love I love the Prusa slicer. Unfortunately, I've only used this one. Uh, but when I was deciding which one to pick, a lot of folks had sent me in this direction, and, and uh, Chad is using 2.1. Uh, I'm at 2.2, and now 2.3 is coming out where you can actually paint on where you want supports. And it, you know, they Prusa for whatever reason, maybe because their printers are, are a little. Um, a little more high end in some ways. I think they have to support the slicer more strongly with more features because the folks that are using the printers may be challenging uh, what needs to be printed. So, so I've been very, very happy with the Prusa slicer, and um, they've already made a couple of updates over the last couple of years and significant changes to uh, what you can and can't do and features that are added. There's a good users group, and they are very responsive to people sending in suggestions. And uh, next thing you know, they've added ironing, uh, which is a nice way to take the top surface of, of uh, a print and get rid of that odd texture that it leaves from the printing and actually irons it out and makes it nice and smooth. So they've been, they've been very good about, um, I'd say, over a six-month basis of the year making changes that are that are not insignificant to the to the uh, software yeah and so to the point of having friends with the same same slicer uh so right before the show we were talking about pausing the printed layers well i always had to kind of watch it and you is the layer the screen says on there and so i was like oh that's a good place to stop it and change color and dave goes no you do it right here and he showed me i'm like i don't have that on mine well i found out that i need to update my my uh the software so um yeah so uh, you know that's a good thing to have other people on the same program and you can ask them questions now if you can go back to your slicer real quick dave i, I do sure. have a question because we're talking about timelines on printing and everything um can you go on there and show the difference between printing one at a 0.05 or 0.5 versus yeah. the so up here in the top right corner up here it says uh the 0 0.20 millimeter quality on there and if you click on that um it will actually sh give you different options for the quality of the print. Is my screen too big that you can't see here? We didn't see anything change. Did you click on it? Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's slower. I just have to. Yeah. So th there's a whole table here, and you can customize these. So for instance, uh, I've got it set now to I'm going to reslice it, but to point one. Uh, millimeter detail. I can't see if that's showing up. There it goes. Yeah, it's there just you go. It. So print settings here, there's a whole table of 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 draft detail quality. And what's kind of nice on the printer settings is you can save this one. So I call this one 0 0.1 detail. I can change the number of layers, the, the, the skirt or brim, how many perimeters there are, how thick is the base, how thick is the top, all that can be done and saved. And so now I just go in and pick up the one that says verbose supports 0.15 and it's already got my settings for what I like for supports for Octoprint, you know, that kind of thing. Right. The in the same way and the printer as well. So on this one here, he's doing it a 0.15 quality print and when he sliced it, so at the bottom, underneath the export G code, there's a slice button, or is it, I think it goes actually where the G code is. It says yeah. right above there, normal mode is 6.37 hours. So six and a half hours. Uh, and the cost would be 95 cents to print that, um, which I think that cost is a little bit high still um, as well, but you can put your cost in. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I've got a premium price for the filament cost or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I got thirty dollars. Uh, thirty dollars per yeah. kilogram in here. So let me put that to what I probably actually paid, and uh, that'll probably change it a little bit too. 
not like people will use this very much, but it's kind of a fun little feature to kind of go over, but pretty much showing the quality that you can do it in versus, and then the time it takes, takes to actually print it. Um, if you went to a really fine detail, I mean, it might kick that up to 10 hours. I don't know. If you go to uh, a draft, it may take it down to an hour and a half. I'm, I'm you know, it just depends on, on what you're making. Right. So I dropped the price to 67 cents when I put in the proper cost for that filament. I'm slicing it at uh, 0.1 millimeters of height, and it's now eight hours. Eight hours uh, worth of time to print that. Yeah, yeah. So just to show people that you know how they can figure out how long it will take to to, to print, and then also the cost because we were talking about cost earlier. So right, right. And obviously, yeah. the finer detail, the more the cost is because it's going to use more filament. Right. Can you guys mute me out for a second, please? Sure. Yep. So I really like that one. That's some of the features that I really like about that one versus uh, Cura right now because of being able to do the, um, as you're going through the layers and say, hey, this is where I want to change the layer right now. So that's that's what I really like about that, um, be able to do it that way. So, well, Chad, we yeah, have yeah. been going for almost an hour and a half. And, and it's been a lot of fun, and I know we can spend so much more, and I, we probably can come back. Uh, on a later show and, and uh, talk about this more uh, very easily. So there's just a lot of different stuff that we can talk about. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize the time. Jeez. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, there's lots of things to talk about. I have lots of stuff I printed. Um, Derek will have lots more. He'll print same with Dave, yep. um, different things going on. If you end up getting a 3d printer, you know, uh, and you make something, uh, you design something, send us an email, let us know what it is. We can share it if you want. Um, you know, you can send us pictures. We'll share it online. Uh, one thing we were going to get to tonight is actually showing some of the builds, but before the show, I actually was kind of figuring this might go a little bit long. So we'll end up doing that next, uh, the next podcast at the end of the month. Um, right. so if you have anything that you've, you've made and you want to share, make sure you send the, the, uh, pictures in, uh, NGC code. If you want to share that to the geocache talk podcast at gmail.com. Uh, and then, you know, make sure if you like the show, give it a thumbs up. We always appreciate that. Oh, yeah. And also I want to make mention that um, the guest that we were going to special guest that was going to be on tonight had an emergency that he wasn't able to make it. So he is going to actually be on Challenge Talk to give you that announcement about what's coming up. Um, but, but you can always go and check out the site and see what's going on with CacheCon. And that's at geocachetalk.com, www forward slash WWCC21 and see it there and always tag. Tag us with the hashtag WWCC21, and we would love to see um, you guys putting it out there. Because, uh, hey, this is worldwide. We got people that are going to be on this from uh, Germany, Australia, Denmark, Belgium. Uh, we're looking at people in, for Korea. I mean, there's it's, it's worldwide, and it's just going to be a lot of fun. So, But really want to appreciate that. I did drop the link into the, on, into the chat with the Dan's uh, link. I think that worked. I saw it popped up over on my YouTube channel, the feed and the chat, and it was a clickable. So that should have worked uh, Trish. So I wanted to let you know about that. Uh, but really thank you guys for joining us tonight. Uh, Dave's back in. So I'm at him back in. So, um, but Dave, uh, any final words? We're kind of wrapping it up real quick tonight. Uh, we're going to end up really tackling back into this uh, on another podcast too. Yeah, there's probably a lot more to talk about, but I hope I, I was surprised how much you can do with limited ability with Tinkercad with a 3D printer. And heck, again, Derek, you started in Christmas and uh, you're already playing with things. So it, it's it's not a it's not a uh, turnkey kind of operation, but actually it's a lot of fun and there's a lot of resources and it's surprising what you can get to with a little bit of time. So. I, I'm really encouraged about 3D printing for geocaching. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. And don't feel intimidated if you feel intimidated. Um, remember, you're not going to really screw anything up. And there's a lot of people out there that are really willing to help help you out and figure out what's going on. So any other final words, Chad? Nope. Just, uh, you know, be back. Uh, join us again back on the uh, 26th, uh, the last Tuesday of the month. And we'll go over some of those builds that people have made, share those, and go over, you know, any other questions that you may have. It's kind of be an open show. All right. Yeah. It's, so looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun. 
and that's right before CashCon. So there may be some more previews and some more announcements that are coming out for that as well. Plus all the different um, podcasts that are coming up. Uh, of course, we've got Challenge Talk coming up on this Thursday. So go check them out. And that's where the, an the announcement's going to be about some of the swag. And then also back on Sunday, Gary and Jesse will be back as well for the flagship show of Geocache Talk. So but thank you, everybody, for joining us. And we will see you at the end of the month.